This is Wells Tech, a show that explores the intersection of technology and ministry. Wells Tech is a part of the Streams Media Network, sponsored by Wells, the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. Your show hosts are Martin Spriggs and Sally Draper. Join the conversation at wellstech.wells.net. Wells Tech is on the air. This is episode 371 for Wells Tech. My name is Martin Spriggs, and today is Tuesday, December 9th, and it's 4, 4.02 p.m. Central Standard Time. And joining me at 4.02 Central Standard Time, as usual, Sally Draper. Sally. Good afternoon, Martin Spriggs. How are you today? I am doing well. Uh, Christmas party this evening at the CMM, so we're looking forward to that. I've got my festive red sweater on, so wish you could join us, but uh, we'll have to have some kind of uh, celebration uh, <laughs> with our new home friends at some point in the near future. There you go. Well, I hope you guys have a great time. It is the season for sure. Yeah. Um, and yeah, at my house the decorations are up and we're, we've are we already indulged a little bit in some of those great Christmas treats. So, fun time of year. The, uh, the Spriggs family did something very unusual this year. It was Thanksgiving weekend that the tree went up. Uh, decorations on, candles up, etc. So uh, we've been enjoying them for a few weeks now. It's, uh, normally we try and wait till after our youngest daughter's birthday, which is the 14th, December 14th, but that just got a little crowded. So we're feeling a little, a little breath of fresh air this year. And she's okay with that too. So. Awesome. Everything's good. Well, shout out to your youngest daughter, Yana, and happy birthday this coming weekend. 21, my baby is. Oh, wow. They grow up fast, huh? Imagine, yeah. Okay. No <laughs> well, we have something to talk about today, Martin. We are here to talk about our book selection of this podcasting season. We've been reading the book What's Best Next. It's by author Matt Herman, and Matt's taking a, a gospel-based approach to productivity. We've never done a productivity book on the podcast before, and um, I've enjoyed the read and I've enjoyed the discussion as well. You are our productivity guru. Um, so uh, I think we're going to kind of roll up our sleeves and get into a little bit more of the hands-on kind of stuff as we move into section three of the book. It's titled Define, Know What's Most Important. So Matt's going to walk us through helping us understand what our core purpose is and, and how to carry that out. Yeah, um, it's been almost introductory material or found, not introductory, foundational material up until this this part three and define where he actually gets into something that you can actually do rather than think about and kind of get in the mood for. Here uh, I found myself kind of jumping over to the computer or a piece of paper and and taking some of the advice and, and I've done some of this before because it really is talking about goal setting and uh, mission statement building, that kind of stuff. I've done that, but I like the way he kind of walks you through the process, not just um, this is what you need, but why you need it and, and obviously some examples of it. Sure, and maybe if we before we dive into that, we can talk just a little bit about his um, acronym DARE, because the next several sections of the book kind of center around that acronym D A R E. The D standing for define, just like we said, this section is based on, and that's where we're going to talk kind of high level, um, maybe um, up in the cloud, kind of looking down on our life and and what's the purpose and, and direction we're headed. That's the define section. And then in subsequent months, we're going to cover the other functions in that DARE acronym, which are architect, reduce, and execute. So again, this is the hands-on kind of um, how to carry this out. And like I said, define is where we're at this week. A uh, couple of quotes I wanted to kind of highlight before we jump in because I think they're they're pretty foundational. One is in actually in that first uh, defined section, uh, it's a real short paragraph. He says the direction we set for ourselves needs to be God centered. John Pieper captures this well. He said, "Whatever you do, find the God centered, Christ exalting, Bible saturated passion of your life." 
and find your way to say it and live for it and die for it and you will make a difference that lasts. You will not, and this is the kind of the key, key uh, sentence, you will not waste your life. And that's kind of been the theme of this whole book. God has a purpose for you. He's put you on this planet for a purpose. Don't waste the opportunities that God provides. Yeah, and God gives us the direction and meaning um, to the work that he gives us to do. So there's a big focus kind of overarching throughout this whole section, and by the end of the section he actually comes out and says it, uh, a focus on the doctrine of vocation, that that what we do is... Um, is given to us by God and it's not just what we do in the nine to five work setting or whatever it's everything that we do in our lives that God gives us those things to do and that you know we should view them that way we should work for God um, be good stewards of the work um, that he gives to us yep. so as a result he goes into this define uh, mode where the purpose of define is really to build, I mean, the where the rubber hits the road in this define section is creating a personal uh, mission statement. You know, this, this one, uh, and it's not just one statement, it's kind of a collection of different things um, that kind of defines who you are and drives what you do. Um, and he really has an interesting way of talking about this because a lot of times when you hear about personal mission statements and purposes and goal setting, it, it's really, he sends, the, the typical author sends the person on a quest to find out um, uh, what it is. Um, and he makes a real interesting statement here. He says, your mission is discovered, not chosen. And really his point, because he's coming from a Christian perspective, is God's already figured that out for you. He has uh, kind of prescribed for you what it is that you're supposed to be doing. So this process for the Christian is to, to uh, discover it, not to choose it. You know, what is it that God has in store for me? Not, well, I'm going to choose this and I'm going to set my life in a direction that I'm going to achieve this. It's, it's really more a discovery process, which is really an interesting take on a personal mission statement. It's, it's digging into God's Word. It's spending the time necessary to determine what is it that God's mapped out for you. And, you know, I think it takes a lot of the pressure off of me, and that's a wonderful thing. Thank you um, to that salvation that was won by Jesus because I have my purpose. My purpose is to to grow in faith and to share the good news. I have my direction and what I do in my daily life, be it in my nine to five job or in my home or, you know, whatever I do, uh, centers around that purpose and, and it's taken care of um, on the cross and it's yep. wonderful. A passage that uh, he really applies rightly here is from Proverbs, uh, Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Uh, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. And that truly describes this discovery process where it's really not all about you, it's all about God and uh, his purpose for you. So Martin, did you actually write down purpose, principles, and core beliefs? Those are kind of the three things that he challenged us to do in this first chapter of this section. I did. Um, and you know, again, I've I've done these kinds of things before, so I repurposed them a little bit, but I put them in this format because it it seemed to resonate with me and make sense to me. This purpose, purpose, principles, and belief statements. Um, maybe a question. I'm, I'm assuming you did too, Sally, as you were going through this. Uh, part of the challenge is, well, where do you write this down? And this is kind of a a, a functional question. Because um, he makes a point of these obviously being things that are that are always in front of you. How did you do that? Where did you where did you write this stuff down? Well, God gave me my Google Drive for just that purpose, I think. So yeah, mine's out in my Google Drive where I um, stumble across it quite often, and and I put it in an obvious place there in my folder structure and stuff. I think I'll probably actually print it out on paper and and hang it up in a couple of places as well. I have a few bulletin boards I can tack it to. That's not that's not a bad idea. Yeah, I used OneNote, which is where I put all my stuff. And I created, uh, I have this personal, called a personal notebook. So it's got all kinds of stuff in it, like tax information and, you know, all that stuff. But uh, it also has a, 
uh, One OneNote has these tabs. So one of my first tabs now is called Life. Um, so it's it's really short, and I've covered colored it orange so it stands out. And in that Life tab, I have my first page that says Mission Statement, and that's where I've got this stuff. But I think your idea is a good one where you, know, you really want this in front of you wherever you go or, or wherever you, you kind of work and spend a lot of your time. So that's uh, that's going to be here in the office. So so how did that go? Was it a struggle for you to kind of think through purpose, principle, belief? Um, you know, I wanted to encapsulate a lot into, you know, some kind of short statements. He has great examples in the book. He gives you a lot of good ideas in a lot of different directions. And um, I just... I just feel just really refreshed to do this by making that focus service and you know the the calling that God's given me the place where he's put me in and you know focusing that way love and serve others above self be the best I can be studying the word and also improving um, in my my work skills and things continuing education and that kind of thing to be the best I can be and then serve others um, with my heart and hands I just think it was a neat, a neat perspective to take, and after reading the book, it was kind of easy to do. Yeah, because he really drilled that home in the first few chapters. It's all about service to others, and our principles, I think, probably look a little bit similar. That's my first one, serve others before self. But a couple of other things came to my mind, and things that maybe I struggle with sometimes, so things that I really want to focus on, and I know that there are weaknesses here, so you know, walk with God daily is one of my principles. Mm -hmm. uh, practice genuine humility, recognize my unworthiness, you know, give glory to God. So get the, get the, direct, the arrow pointing you know, in the right direction. Um, and I, it was a very interesting and um, maybe awakening experience, and I think it's good for people to do this. And a lot of this is it's it's in your mind, and you think about some of these things once in a while. But it's good to intentionalize it. And there's something there's something about writing it down that okay. makes a difference. I don't know if you found the same thing. I did, and I actually um, gave mine to my husband and asked him to review it and discuss it with me too. So we kind of worked through it together. I think what the key to it is, though, is is taking that investment of time and thought and not putting it aside, but remembering it when you're in that heated meeting or whatever the circumstances are, when you're under duress in whatever way that you stay focused on you know what your purpose really is and what it is you believe and and why you're here and how you want to serve others and that kind of thing yeah the last two kind of segments that are part of this uh, this whole section uh, beyond purpose and uh, principles and belief are life goal which uh, and these go from more abstract to um, more granular more you know, this is how I'm going to direct my work in life. So that life goal was kind of an interesting experience as well, where you're trying to get kind of very focused. Um, my particular life goal that, that I wrote down was facilitate ministry uh, through my own light-filled life and salty work. So I played off of a Matthew that Matthew 5 passage where we're both salt and light and tried to incorporate that into a statement that would maybe um, encapsulate my my you know my opportunities for service uh, so facilitating ministry provide tools provide encouragement provide mentoring whatever in whatever situation that uh, that casts light and uh, is salty that that will last it will season so you did good. I, I struggled with this life goal. This is where I kind of hit a wall because I, I do a lot of different things and it was really hard for me to pull it together into one. But I did end up with something similar, I guess, to yours. I said, it, you know, do this, this, and this so that technology can assist efforts to reach out with the gospel message to children in the classroom, to parishioners in the pew, and to unbelievers in every nation. So it was kind of um, parallel. Yep. But, yep. but you know, it's really hard to wrap into one statement all the things you do. And, and so that was a challenge for me. But I did, I did want to include in that goal, you know, 
that direction that I want it to be to, right. mm -hmm. and to that's reach out. It should, it should be something that you can watch yourself um, achieve or watch God work through you to accomplish mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And then the last section was all about roles. And this is um, this is kind of, uh, could be all over the place because we have, uh, and he, he makes a good point that uh, don't get too granular here, but kind of use big buckets of, of roles. And he, uh, and you maybe have the same uh, categories that I have, individual roles, um, you know, for your individual life, family, church, social, and professional. And I kind of bullet pointed a bunch of things there that, uh, some things that you want to, uh, you know, remind yourself of that you have responsibilities here, that you have uh, opportunities for service, uh, both to yourself, to your Lord, and then obviously to other people. So. Yeah, I did have parallels, and then I had a category called extras because there's just way too many <laughs> roles that we all end up playing, you know. So I threw in an extras category as well. Sometimes. Yeah. Taking the time to write these down can feel a little bit overwhelming. And he even said you may want to take it a step further and actually create a role plan where for each individual role you get more intentional by writing out a purpose, a strategic principles, and activities for that role. And, you know, that could take some time, but it also maybe is is worth investing and in, in being more um particular and, and having more of a vision of what you want to accomplish for each of those different roles. Yep. So for an example, trying to get specific, a uh, couple of my roles under social, I have Wells Tech uh, because I value the relationships that we have and I want to, that we have both between you and I, but also you know all of our listeners and viewers, mm -hmm. and I want that to be something I intentionalize and have goals around. That's a role that I have. And then under professional, I have podcaster, you know, and that's something that I want to excel at, something that I want to get better at and in service to the church and in service to the people who watch and listen. So. Yep. And I put things like wife and mom and daughter because yeah. I think, you know, in our personal lives, we do need to, you know, be intentional. My mom's a, a thousand miles away, so I have to think about how I can serve her from this distance and stuff. Yep. So. Good stuff. Yeah. So I think um, the, what I really appreciate about, uh, about this kind of conversation versus like what you'd get in getting things done or. There's another book that David Allen has written, Ready for Anything, that really talks specifically about goal setting, mm -hmm. uh, purely from a secular perspective. This obviously puts the uh, the horse before the cart and gives you that motivation to even want to do this, saying, hey, this is important stuff, and God has something to say about it. So good uh, uh Good on Matt for this section. I think there's a, that's probably one of the strengths of this particular book. Now, I haven't read the rest of the book, so I'm not, you know, I can't offer a, opinions on kind of the methodologies maybe for, uh, you know, you know getting, getting the right things done in the right you know, order in the right time. But uh, I think yep. I, really, I really enjoyed this section. Yep. So people got to stay tuned. They got to tune in next month when we talk about that next component of the D.A.R.E. model, and we'll get even more hands-on when we do that. Yep. Um, Sally, we do have an interview this week. Um, we've kind of debated whether we needed an interview, and we thought, yeah, we did the, we, re we, pre we pre recorded it, we might as well play it. This is somebody that uh, you met up in New Ulm who was doing a presentation up there. That's right. I had the chance to meet Justin Ware from um, BWF Social, and uh, he was talking about um, specifically about having some social media and giving opportunities around social media. But his message kind of resonated with me that uh, we use social media as congregations and schools perhaps to share messages and some of the techniques that he shared and ideas that he shared would certainly be applicable to our organizations. And so we invited Justin to sit down with us and, and recorded an interview that we want to share now. Joining us today on Wells Tech is my good friend Justin Ware. Justin comes to us from BWF Social, where he serves as the Director of Interactive Communication. That's that's quite a mouthful, Justin. Thank you for joining us today. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. Maybe I should work on that title to make it a, make it roll off the tongue a little bit more easily. 
<laughs> or work on my communication skills. That's what we're all about. Huh? <laughs> right. uh, I had the pleasure of meeting you face to face, Justin, when you visited Martin Luther College a few weeks ago. We talked a lot about um, social media strategies and different things around um, communication uh, at that time. And I thought it would be wonderful, and you were agreeable to joining us here on the Wells Tech Podcast um, to share a little bit of those ideas with our um, our listening audience, kind of a variety of church and school and lay workers out there in, in the Wells that are part of Wells Tech. So um, maybe to kick things off, if you could introduce yourself a little bit more, tell us about um, you know, who Justin is, where you're located, what kind of things you do. Sure, sure. So my name is Justin Ware, Director of Interactive Communication at, at BWF Social, just as you mentioned. Uh, we work with nonprofits to do really everything. Uh, so BWF Social is part of Ben Swilly Flessner. Ben Swilly Flessner is the firm. BWF Social is a practice. Practice, and I always say that just because the website's bwfsocial.com. Uh, but we work with uh, healthcare institutions, higher education institutions, uh, social service, poverty relief, hunger relief nonprofits, uh, conservation, environmental nonprofits. Really anyone. Uh, who uses philanthropy to support their mission, uh, and really any part of that philanthropic mission our firm works with. My area, online social media. So a lot of giving days, uh, a lot of social media strategies, peer-to-peer uh, -peer online ambassador programs, content marketing strategies. That's really been our focus. Uh, before that, I was at the University of Minnesota, and before that, I was a professional journalist, uh, mostly in television, but also in print for a bit. Uh, I live with my wife Paige in Minneapolis. We have a little boy named August, just turned 16 months old today, and a pretty loyal little dog named Tupper too. What a blessing. Great. Well, thank you so much again for being with us. I, I had the opportunity, as I said, to sit in on a session, and one of the things I keyed off of was, was that um, a, a lot about communication and sharing and particularly using social media to do that. And so um, just thinking about our churches and schools, which are not large organizations with lots of staff to coordinate those kind of efforts, but um, I'm wondering if it's worth their time even to, to look at social media communication channels. Should they have a strategy or a plan around social media? It's a great question and a changing answer, I think. Uh, I think maybe five or ten years ago, you might have said, you know, there's some more important channels, some more important audience segments. If we can get to a Twitter account, if we can get to a Facebook page, fine, we will, but uh, we have to first take care of our direct mail program and we have to take care of our event planning. You know, the, the tricky part is, the challenge is, you still have to take care of your direct mail program, you still have to take care of your event planning, you still have to take care of all those traditional channels, but... Uh, the online and social media segment, audience segment, has grown quite a bit. Uh, you know, it's not just kids. And even when we say just kids, if we're talking millennials, millennials are in their mid-30s now. Uh, so a pretty sizable segment of our followers are very active online. And then we look at some of the numbers like uh, a Dunham & Company study that just came out this year that says people age 66 and older, uh, more than half of them now prefer to actually give online. So... Whether you're talking about fundraising, whether you're talking about communications, whether you're talking about trying to reach your audience with a message, the online and social media segment and the number of people who get their news from places like Facebook and Twitter, it's simply too large to ignore. And in some cases, uh, depending on the organization, it might be one of your largest audience segments, actually. Awesome. I think one of the goals that a lot of our organizations have when they're thinking about social media is to increase engagement. Uh, spawn the conversation, get people comfortable talking with them, and then ultimately uh, maybe increase the uh, the analog nature of the relationship so that there's that face-to-face -face conversion. As you're maybe counseling a nonprofit whose goal is that, what are some good short, maybe medium and long-term goals that they could maybe set up initially? Uh, are there some general ones that you could recommend? Uh, as far as measurements, are you, are you talking? Uh, yeah, basically. Measures? Yeah, what's uh, what uh, what kind of targets might they expect? You know, given what you maybe know about uh, some of these smaller nonprofits that make up uh, our church body. Sure, I think it, it probably comes from de defining what does online engagement mean. Is that kind of what you're getting at? Mm -hmm. So there's two sep different sets of metrics. I think when we're talking about something that isn't uh, well, I suppose fundraising is part of it, but. Uh, there's two different categories of metrics that, that we like to kind of break things up in, one being uh, vanity metrics and the other being meaningful metrics. Because one is meaningful does not mean that vanity is meaningless. Vanity metrics still have a lot of meaning. So vanity metrics are things like 
a like on a Facebook page, uh, a share of a blog post, a retweet of a tweet, uh, a repost of an Instagram item, something along those lines where uh, it's sort of a digital action. Uh, it's something that takes place on one of the networks or on uh, one of your platforms. Um, and it does matter because that means that you have people who are interacting with your content. That means you have people who are receiving your message, uh, understanding your message, and really liking your message. Uh, and uh, you know, when it comes to building a larger community, strengthening your community, I think that's an important metric to keep track of are those vanity metrics. So you might look at a Facebook page and you might say, okay, uh, how many people are fans of this Facebook page? That's an easy one. Uh, if you know if you've doubled your Facebook fans, you're doing something right. Uh, but beyond that, then there's another metric for Facebook called engagement. And uh, you look at a Facebook page, you'll see, I think there's uh, just above the number of fans, maybe it says people, and you click on that. Uh, don't, don't hold me to that title, but it's right above the number of fans. And if you click on that, it will tell you the number of uh, engagements with your posts over the course of a week. And it changes from week to week. Uh, and for that, we like to look at about, well, let's say 5 or 10% of your total fan base. If that many people are engaging with content, that to me says it's a pretty healthy community. That to me, that to me says, you know, especially if you have 10, 15, 20,000 people on a Facebook page, or even a few thousand people on a Facebook page, if you have several hundred people engaging with your message on a weekly basis, I think that's a really good metric, and it means you have a community in that space that's receiving the message, hearing it, sharing it, spreading it. Uh, so that's the vanity side of it. And then, of course, there's a meaningful metrics. Um, those are things that can be directly attributed to online uh, activities, such as an online fundraising number, number of, people make it, number of people who make a gift online or through email or something along those lines. Of course, through email is also online. Uh, or it could be overall fundraising. Uh, you might notice that your retention numbers are up quite a bit since you launched that new website and since you put someone in charge of social media channels on a daily basis. Uh, we've seen that uh, actually with a faith-based organization uh, in the United States, uh, international organization, faith-based international uh, relief organization that saw a, a, an 11% increase in their overall retention rate uh, from the point when they launched their new website about a year or two ago. Um, so, you know, there, there's meaningful metrics that are directly tied to online, such as online fundraising numbers, and there's meaningful metrics such as uh, members of a congregation, uh, retention of donors, uh, people who have signed up to take part in a camp, a retreat, a ministry program, all of those things, uh, if, you can, if you can correlate it with uh, you know, a significant change in your online presence and activity and resources, uh, you can probably attribute that back to the online. So again, there's, there's the vanity metrics, which is essentially Facebook likes. There's the meaningful metrics, which are things you can count. And then I think within meaningful metrics, there's those that are directly related uh, and those that you... Uh, you know, you, you, you'd measure it the same way you would measure an ad campaign, essentially. Okay. This, this um, I, I get this question a lot um, when I'm talking about social media and maybe uh, churches and schools and faith-based or, faith organizations you know, trying to get uh, some value out of their social networking experience. Um, I think when I'm done talking with them, and I'm sure when they get done listening to you, they're going to say, this sounds really hard. <laughs> is that accurate? I mean, is it hard, or, or are we? Is there a shorter? Is there a shortcut or some quick things that uh, could make a big difference? Well, you know what, Martin, that's a great point because I, I don't want people to think it's a magic sauce they can just spread out uh, one day and have these giant seeds grow to the sky uh, without any investment, without any work. Um, it does take some resources. Uh, it does take time, uh, human resources more than anything else, especially right. talking about managing social media channels, managing that conversation. Essentially, you're talking about working with people and having relationships with people through digital channels. And of course, you know, relationships require people. So I think human resources are a big part of it. I think there's also the technological resources of you know having a good website, of having a community online that uh, is easy to work with. Uh, is easy to become a part of, uh, is useful to your audience. Uh, so there is, you know, there there is an investment that's needed both in time and financial resources. Uh, I always make the argument, though, that it generally pays off for any organization that makes those investments. So speaking of magic sauce, one thing we like to see in social media is something that goes viral, and it seems pretty random that um, some posts that 
you didn't even maybe give much thought to, or some video that's 20 seconds long all of a sudden has a million followers for whatever reason, you know. And um, I guess I'm wondering if there's any possible way or formula to make something go viral. It's a great question. Uh, you know, getting lucky is is great, but it's not something you, really, you can really count on, <laughs> that's for sure. Uh, you know, there is. And, and, and Sally, that's, that's a great question, too, because... Mm -hmm. It's something that I've been asked for as long as I've been working in digital communication, which is uh, the better part of a decade now. Uh, and when I started, people wanted viral hits. They wanted a viral YouTube video. Uh, and it was really hard to predict how something might go viral, how it might not. It was kind of a lightning in a bottle thing. But in the work we've done, especially in fundraising lately, we've realized that, well, okay, what does viral really mean? It means people start sharing something, and then more people share something, and then more people share that thing. And it's... It expands exponentially. That's really what viral, uh, something, when something goes viral, you're saying it expanded exponentially as far as other people who've seen it, shared it, viewed it, whatnot. So if you have an online ambassador program, which is really just the word we, the term we use to talk about peer-to-peer -peer programs, where you find your biggest supporters online uh, and you work with them to get your message out to a wider base of supporters, a wider community. So you find people who have a big community, you find people who are very interested in your mission, and you work with them, again, a big online community, people, these people have a big online community, and you work with them so that they distribute your message to their big community, and then people in their big community spread that message to people in their community. And actually, uh, you know, six, seven years ago, I would say, no, we don't really know how to make something go viral. I'd say we can make good content for you that your audience will like, uh, but we can't make something go viral. That's changed. Today, we can make something go viral. We can make your message spread exponentially by finding the people who are most influential in the online space and working with them to share your message. So just kind of breaking that down, I'm sorry, Martin, to um, like our congregation level, what you're saying is there are members of our congregation who are who have a lot of friends on Facebook or a lot of followers on Twitter and and identifying them and helping maybe coaching them or encouraging them or asking them outright to share the next message that you post on your church Facebook page or whatever it may be. Sounds, uh, sounds very Gladwellian. Um, so <laughs> you're trying to find uh, you're trying to find these uh, these influencers, these people that just need to be uh, uh, enabled. You know, I think in in our congregations and in our organizations, there's there's certainly those that are connected more than others, and uh, to to light their fire uh, would light other fires, right? That's precisely it. Precisely it. And, you know, for a certain segment of people, this is a really fun way to volunteer. Uh, it meets where they are. It meets what they're interested in. And I think it's a great volunteer opportunity for some people who might be looking for a, a different type of opportunity to volunteer. Or maybe people who are very, very busy uh, but are active in those uh, social spaces. It, it is important uh, that you're not just asking the entire congregation to share something on Twitter. Uh, but it is important that you find people who truly have that influence online. And that's where the program gets tricky, uh, finding those influencers and then working with them and incentivizing them to share your message. But uh, yes, uh, it, just as you said, uh, you work with them, uh, light the spark underneath them, and then they take that and they ignite a spark uh, underneath uh, many of their friends and followers. It's just networking. It's just uh, you know really something that our biggest supporters have been doing for a very, very long time, uh, saying good things about us. The difference now is technology has given them a platform that helps it grow exponentially. And I'm thinking that maybe a sustainable plan, um, so you're not just making this connection with these influencers and feeding them a little bit once or twice and letting it die, but having a strategy behind it and, a, and continuing to keep those communications going out to this influencer population. Yeah, and that, that's why I call it a volunteer program because it's not just, uh, you know, we'd like to get our newsletter out to more people this time, so let's find some people and ask them to share it on social media, but really building a program, identifying the online ambassadors, engaging them so that they uh, are part of an official program uh, and helping them uh, to understand the program, understand their impact. Uh, that's part of it because some people might not believe or might not think that they have that much of an impact, but in fact they do uh, when they share Stewardship's part of it, uh, and that can be really something as simple as providing a reward system. You can gamify the process and make it a lot of fun to participate and have people earn rewards. And uh, you know, they might be real, tangible prizes. They might be virtual prizes, but just something that kind of adds a, an element of gamification to it. And then finally, deploying them, uh, 
building this group of ambassadors into your overall communication strategy. So that's kind of the four-step approach we've taken with identification, engagement, stewardship, and deployment uh, to put uh, to put ambassadors to work uh, getting the good word out for your organization. And that makes a lot of sense to me, that, that process and that strategy, because I think a lot of organizations try and wedge the organization itself into the... Uh, you know the life stream of an individual, and uh, that doesn't work. That's like an ad, that's an advertiser model, uh, but when you've got a spokesperson or just na you know normal people out there kind of carrying the water, um, that's far more effective and I think far more natural. Yeah, I think for as long as people have been talking with each other, we've valued the opinion of our friends and our family and our colleagues and our fellow churchgoers over the opinion of just about anyone else that we know. Uh, or anyone else we don't know, uh, like an official organization, even if we trust that organization, it just means more when it comes from someone we personally know. Mm. Justin, really appreciate you spending some, some time with us and sharing your insights. I know that it, uh, your message and your your counsel was well received uh, at, uh, at New Elm there at uh, Martin Luther College, and uh, thank you for your willingness to share this uh, free of charge to our, our Wells Tech uh, listeners and viewers as well. Appreciate your time. Yeah, I'm happy to do it. I'm happy to have the opportunity to talk with you. Thanks. How do people get in touch with you if they want to learn more or read some of your stuff? The website is bwfsocial, all one word, dot com. Uh, B is in boy, W, F is in Frank, social dot com. Email is jware at bwf uh, dot com. And I do have a blog. Uh, it's justinjware uh, dot com. Very good. Thank you again, uh, Justin. Really appreciate it. And blessings on your holiday season. Thank you. Same to you. And again, our thanks to Justin, and I, I thought that was a really uh, revealing conversation and kind of a new, not a new concept, but a, but a common sense concept of this, uh, you know, these individual champions uh, who, who take a responsibility for, for doing this versus, you know, this organizational, you know, initiative. So just find the... Uh, you know, the, the people who have a passion for it, a gift for it, and leverage them. Absolutely. I love that he called it a volunteer opportunity, and I think um, a lot of people would appreciate that kind of way to volunteer and help spread the good news that way. Another interesting statistic he gave was kind of that 5 to 10 percent engagement rate. Um, I don't know how you get that. I think that's a, that's a challenge, but certainly a goal uh, you need to set goals like that to evaluate your stewardship to determine you know, is this thing working or do we need to do something different versus you know just throwing good money after bad or just you know spending a lot of effort and and really getting no results. God would, God I think would ask us to evaluate uh, our effort and uh, place our time and our talents and our treasures in the most uh, productive ways. Definitely, and we have ways for our listeners to make use of their time and talent with some ministry resources. Yeah, I saw you were a a active on Pinterest uh, earlier today. <laughs> That's right. Um, let's see if I can share my screen and I'll share what I pinned on the Wells Tech Pinterest board. It's a link to a, a website called Women's Ministry Toolbox. I'm going to have to dig a little deeper here, but it looks like they have a lot of things to assist with women's ministry programs. And I know um, Women enjoy programming kind of things, and it's nice sometimes to have a theme to an event that you're planning or whatever. This particular resource is 31 Christmas Fellowship Ideas, and they have, um, you know, gift exchange and ornament exchange, Christmas caroling, gift making party where you provide the supplies and perhaps make something for your homebound members or something like that, birthday party for Jesus, Christmas for others. Um, staff, seniors, nursing home, whatever, um, Christmas movie viewing, lots of different ideas here that may spark something um, for your women's ministry efforts. Now I know it's kind of probably late in the game to be thinking about Christmas planning events, but um, some of these could certainly be morphed into women's events at any time of the year. And like I said, perhaps you want to just bookmark this website, uh, womensministrytoolbox.com, and come back and look here for ideas as well. So that's our ministry resource for the week. Nice, nice find. Mm -hmm. Let's move on to our news and tech. And Sally, you also uh, discovered something here we're sharing. 
Right. Um, I found an article on CNET, a real recent release on CNET, about a new keyboard that works with iOS 8. So um, one of the features of iOS 8 is that you can actually switch keyboards. So um, they walk you through in this CNET article how to make use of that feature and to switch to this $1.99 app called Translate Keyboard Pro. And the idea is that you type in your language and it automatically translates it into the receiver's language. So if you have a language barrier between uh, you and someone you're chatting with, for instance, you can type and they'll receive it in their particular language. Now it's available in the iTunes App Store and it says that you can translate from 30 source languages into 80 target languages. So it looks like a very big variety of languages available and it just allows you to chat globally basically. So if you are of the global mindset and looking for a tool to do some translation for you, you can build it right into your iOS keyboard now with this Translate Keyboard Pro. Yeah, this could almost be called a ministry resource as well because I can imagine conversations going on that are in need of of something like this. Is there a cost to it, Sally? It's a dollar ninety nine. Okay. Not bad. What's been have you tried any third party keyboards on your iOS devices, your iPad or your iPhone, and what's been your experience with them? I haven't, but I did read the reviews here and people are basically saying it's a good start, but it is slow. So the translation process takes time. It's not, you know, you're not going to type 90 words, words a minute if you can do that on a, a small <laughs> phone screen. It's not going to translate that quickly. Yeah. I, my experience with these third-party keyboards or just the keyboard in general on iOS 8 has not been real positive so far. It's really buggy. You know, sometimes it'll disappear. You know, sometimes it'll, you know, actually float up into the upper left corner of the screen where you can't even tap on it, um, won't appear when you need it to appear, won't disappear when you need it to disappear. So I hope they're working on that fix, but I really like the fact that they're allowing these third-party third, third party keyboards now, just like Android has for a long time, because of applications like this. So uh, hopefully that'll get better over time and these will these will become more and more useful. Okay. Time for our picks of the week. And I will go first um, with a Pick Monkey pick of the week. It's been a while since I talked about Pick Monkey. Pick Monkey is my favorite online image editor, and today I want to focus on the fact that they have themes specifically for um, Christmas and winter. And so I, I brought up a photo in my um, Pick Monkey editor to demonstrate it for those that are able to watch the video. Pick Monkey has kind of a sideways approach to their menu system. If you aren't familiar with it, there are icons along the left column, and that's the the different areas of the system. So the first one is just basic edits and then you can move into effects and touch up and adding text and adding different overlays and frames and things. The last icon in the left column, um, right now it looks like a snowflake. That kind of changes depending on the season of the year, but that's the themes area. So when you click on one of these icons in the left column, you get an expanded secondary column on the left where you have different options and there's all kinds of themes here um, from comic heroes to school to sweethearts and two um, particularly for this time of year Santa land and winter land. Oh, I and, thought you were going to pick zombies there. No I'm not into the zombie thing but they got they got it going on for that too. Yeah. Um, I'm going to focus on winter land um, and what they've done here is they pull together all kinds of different effects and overlays and uh, frames and text features that um, go with that theme. For instance, they have a snowfall effect. So if you click on that, you can add snow to your image and you can um, you know, decide how much or how little snow you want on your image with the sliders that are available to you. Um, they have chill, which um, just makes the image look cold and blue. They have frost, which gives you kind of a white oh, frame cool. around the image. Mm -hmm. And you yeah. can play with all of these different things. They have overlays that you can add to your imagery. So if I wanted some pine cones in there or whatever, um, you can do that as well. Um, 
Let me just press delete. And again, it's all kind of themed around um, the section that you drilled down into. So there are frames um, that go along with that theme, and there are even specific fonts that work well with that particular theme. Um, so I actually went into our Christmas card picture for my family, and I added an overlay and used some of the fonts that were available here to add a little text on my picture before I sent it to Walmart to get um, my prints made for our Christmas card picture. And I did it all here on PicMonkey with their overlays and things. So that's what brought it to mind for me because I made use of some of these on my Christmas card picture. I thought um, others that are listening might want to check out the themes on PicMonkey. PicMonkey.com. Very cool. As always, a good pick with PicMonkey. Um, yep. Very appropriate. Sally, my pick is related to our conversation about uh, what's best next and uh, personal mission statements and those kinds of things. One of the things that uh, Matt Perman talks about in this, the chapters that we read this week uh, or for this week were um, related to journaling. Uh, he talked a little bit about some of the value uh, that journaling provides. And I've kind of gone in and out of journaling over the years, but uh, now reading this book and kind of being inspired with uh, you know the creation of a new uh, mission statement, I felt now is time to get back into it. And uh, I've, I've used this tool in the past, but uh, yeah, now I'm kind of redoubling my efforts to, to make good use of it. And it's an iPhone, iPad, or Mac app. This is not available on Windows. So uh, unfortunately this is an Apple only pick. It's called Day One. And uh, Day One is a, simple, a very simple and elegant journaling app. So uh, the way it's designed, and it'll work across all of your devices, so if you use a Mac or if you use iPhone or iPad, you can use any of those to enter your, your journal. Uh, but it allows uh, for the inclusion of images. It will do timestamps. It will do location mapping. So it'll even uh, kind of record the weather uh, when it is that you uh, that you journaled. Uh, you can do it obviously as many times during the day as you like. Uh, one of the neat things about uh, the tool is it allows you not just to uh, journal, which is is more private. Uh, but also allows you to share that via different social networks. So if you journal about something that, hey, you just don't want to keep to yourself, but you want to share on Twitter or Facebook, whatever, you have the opportunity to, uh, to hook that app up and it uh, shares it out real nicely. It's a, a visually rich uh, uh, tool very easy to use and uh, because it works across all the platforms it uh, it works through CloudSync or Dropbox uh, it uh, it does a nice job at letting you get at your information from wherever you are. It allows you to do some tagging uh, and they provide all kinds of resources online for suggestions about how to to use the app. So it could be from you know food type blogging to um, uh, book reviews to uh, reflections on you know, scripture readings, which is kind of how I'm using it. So I have my scripture reading time in the morning, and uh, right after or while I'm doing that, then I'll open up uh, uh, the app, this day one app, and uh, journal my thoughts about it. Now, those I don't typically share unless I feel that I really want to share this on Facebook or Twitter, but uh, lots of different opportunities to... Uh, to use the app and it's kind of fun. It's kind of a fun app too where you can do some tagging and um, uh, all kinds of use cases for it including uh, location mapping and uh, uh, those kinds of things. So I'm enjoying it and uh, it is not free. I believe it is $9.99 on the Mac or $4.99 on an iOS device whether that be uh, um, iPhone, iPad, or uh, iPod, I think it even works at. So uh, nice visually attractive uh, tool that uh, I think if you're on those platforms and you're looking for a journaling tool, might be something you would uh, consider. So one, uh, day one is the, the name of the app. 
I have that app marked on my iPad, and uh, one thing I like about it is it nags me every once in a while if I you have it. You can set it up and say, hey, remind yeah. me at whatever yeah. time. Yeah. yeah. And I do enjoy going back and looking at my um, entries, and I do usually add the weather. <laughs> I don't know why it is that our conversations oftentimes center around the weather, but we maybe it's weather. because... <laughs> the weather's a big deal. <laughs> yeah, when I'm writing it, I'm we really were living in Los Angeles, it would be 70 and sunny every day, not as exciting, but right. snow flurries or blizzard conditions or 40 mile per hour winds, right. that's interesting. I almost fell on the ice today. Hmm. Yeah. We always did something in, in college. Uh, we kind of had an informal bet who was going to be the first one to take a dive on uh, the uh, the ramp out of the dorm. It was not a, it was not steps. It was kind of a you know handy, oh. semi handicap accessible uh, ramp. Uh, but that thing that sucker would ice up, and uh, we kind of had fun. And, uh, <laughs> you know, at somebody else's expense. Hopefully, it wasn't you. As to you were the first to go down. But uh, yeah. Anyway, yep. so day cool one is place. nice. Let's move on to Wells Insider. Sure. Just a brief mention of a couple of concerts going on this weekend. Um, you can watch live streaming of either the Seminary Christmas concert or there's one at Luther Prep. Both at the same time, though, they're competing with each other. Sunday at 3 p.m. Central. We'll have links in the show notes to both of the live streaming pages. Um, the good news is the Luther Prep concert's being repeated on Thursday morning at 10 a.m. So you can watch then if you want to watch the Sim concert on Sunday. Yeah, I don't know if you gonna... tuned in for the MLC one. It was this past weekend. I, it was awesome. I didn't. Uh, but the good news is that using this live stream tool, you can actually watch the replay. Oh, there you go. So. Awesome. Uh, need to know a couple things, and we've mentioned this each and every week, but uh, it's getting close to uh, having to, to get your um, registration in for final web training. If you are a final web webmaster, this is the training for you. It's all online, three days of training, beginner, intermediate, and advanced. You can sign up for one or all three. Sally is uh, leading that training, and the dates, again, Sally, are... January 21st, 22nd, and 23rd. It'll be from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. each of those days. So, yep, join me online. We'll do it via Google Hangouts. We will learn a lot about Final Web. And where do they go to sign up? Um, that's at bit.ly slash FW training info. And we'll have that link in the show notes as well. Okay. Just a quick reminder about Wells Tech Conference 2015. That is July 9th through 11th in Waukesha, Wisconsin. Wells.net slash WellsTechConf. C-O-N-F. So registration is not open, but you can go to that page and uh, put your name uh, and email address in, and we'll keep you posted as things develop. We're planning on opening up registration around February 1st. Uh, there is an early bird rate. Um, we're really excited about some of the programs that we have in store for people who attend that conference and the keynotes. Good ones. Yeah, it's going to be a good time. Looking forward to it. Come Who's in. Back. Who's talking yeah. to us? Um, first up, we had an email from Pastor Clint Rogus, and he was writing to you, Martin, about the Surface Pro 3. That's your go-to computer these days. Looks a lot like a tablet, but apparently... It's got the whole computing thing going on, and Clint was thinking of, of making the switch and wondering about your experience with the Surface Pro. Yeah, Clint has been disenfranchised with uh, Mac, uh, <laughs> MacBook Air. Maybe I'm not sure what which model he has. Uh, he probably says in the email, I don't have it in front of me, but he's having all kinds of problems, especially with his Bible application not being real friendly with uh, the latest uh, Yosemite release. So, and he's had this computer in a number of times to replace different things, and he's kind of uh, looking at maybe throwing in the towel and going Windows. And was wondering about uh, my experiences with the Surface Pro 3. You've probably seen a lot of commercials lately about the Surface Pro. They put a lot of marketing dollars into it, and wondering if I was still as bullish on the product as I was when I first reviewed it. And I'd say, in general, yeah, absolutely. Would I say it's a tablet replacement? I'd say probably not. I still use my iPad, mostly because of the app ecosystem. Uh, today's uh, pick is just a great example. Day one does not exist on a Windows uh, machine, so it's uh, you know there's some trade-offs. 
Uh, I do like the uh, the solid quality of the surface. You could use it if you uh, as a tablet if you wanted to. If you're if the apps that you need uh, are existing in that Windows App Store, um, really portable. Uh, screen's a little bit small, but that depends on your eyesight. Uh, so mine's <laughs> not as good as it used to be, but the uh, the portable nature of it and uh, it's just a good quality machine. And I think. Uh, with a docking station especially is a good desktop replacement. I use it each and every day for all my work and uh, really don't have many complaints about it. If you're somebody who likes to uh, use the uh, pen, uh, digital pen works real well on the tablet as well. So lots of uh, considerations there if you want to go that route, but I would say just you know, think uh, Think uh, think hard about uh, being a tablet replacement, depending on what your app needs are. Clint. Very good. Um, also, we had a link shared with us from Tim Gablehouse. Um, hopefully, I didn't butcher your name, Tim. I know that's a recurring theme on Wells Tech, but. Um, <laughs> Uh, this is for Mac users who uh, are missing a little bit of the functionality of the home and end keys. Now, um, if I understand correctly from the article, on a PC, home and end typically take you to the beginning and ending of the line that you're on. And on the Mac, home and end take you to the top and bottom of a document that you're working in. So with this um, functionality change, and you do it in a file, a system file, and he gives you the path, it's library, key bindings, default key bindings, you find that, you update the directories to to change the functionality of the home and the end keys on your Mac keyboard, and then they'll behave the way you're used to on a PC, where home and end will go to the beginning and ending of the line that you're editing. So um, a little bit of a geeky um, solution there, but for folks that are in that Mac world and looking for that kind of functionality, it seems like a pretty easy solution to put in place. You just have to do a, a, a quick edit on a system file. So check out the article. It's from Lifehacker. I think Tim said it was kind of a lifesaver for him that he appreciated cool. finding that. And if you're on a MacBook uh, Air or MacBook Pro, uh, never mind because there are no home and end keys on your keyboard. <laughs> Most laptops don't have that, but uh, those are apparently uh, on the expanded keyboard that uh, sometimes come along with um, iMacs and uh, you know some of the other keyboards, Bluetooth keyboards, I suppose. So, good tip. Thank you, Tim. Next week, uh, speaking of iOS devices, Sally and I are going to share uh, what is on our phone home screens. That's kind of sacred territory, and it might be interesting for us to kind of walk through each of us what we feel uh, qualifies as home screen material. I, one of my tips last week was you know, how to position icons on your home screen. I'm going to take that one step further and kind of do a quick walkthrough of what we feel is important to be one click away on our smartphones. So you want to tune in next week for that. Um, are we expecting controversy? Are we expecting opposing viewpoints? Or controversy is always good for podcasts. So yeah. See, I think get that's as contentious as possible. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure so. we'll have some same, you know, some sameness, but also some some differences of opinions too. So, so yeah, so tune know. in for the throwdown. We'll, we'll see we'll who wins. We'll throw down the glove. We'll, we'll throw the glove. <laughs> uh, we, so, featured video this week, Sally. We are going to include in our show notes a video from our friend Dawn Michelle Williams. She's a Wells artist in North Carolina, and she's actually doing a concert this Sunday as well. So if you're in the North Carolina area and can go uh, to the Durham, let's see, it's the Durham Arts Council's PSI Theater in Durham, North Carolina, you might want to attend Dawn Michelle Williams' Wonder Concert. She has a beautiful preview video of the concert, and you can check that out on the Wells Tech show notes page. She has a beautiful voice. God has really blessed her with that. So if you don't get a chance to go to the concert, be sure to watch the video. Mm -hmm. If you'd like to contribute to the show, uh, if you can't uh, join us live and in person, so to speak, and ask your questions right within the Q&A tool at 4 o'clock uh, 
Central on Tuesday afternoons, you can always uh, respond uh, to us via our website, wellstech.wells.net. Uh, across the top of the site, there are all kinds of links to different uh, social uh, networks that we are a part of, including Google Plus and Digo and Pinterest and Twitter and Facebook um, and uh, just different ways to get in touch with us. You can leave us a good old-fashioned voicemail right on the screen there um, or just send us an email, wellstech at wells.net. We would love to include your thoughts, comments, suggestions. Uh, tell us what's on your home screen and why it's there. Uh, I'd love to include that in the show. So that is at your disposal, so please take advantage of that. Um, that's going to about do it. Uh, our thanks again to Justin for joining us and sharing some of his wisdom on social networks. Uh, join us again next week. Until then, blessings on your week, and see you soon. <laughs>